The following message was delivered at the 2010 Iron Sharpens Iron Conference at Emmaus Bible College by Alex Strauch, author and gifted teacher. The title of his message is Developing Personal Holiness. I was thinking, how am I going to keep you awake at 3 o'clock in the afternoon after you've eaten that wonderful meal? And I thought, the answer is right on my chest. If you start feeling a little tired, take this card, stretch it as far as you can, and let it go. Now, just practice that once. Try that. It will wake you up, so if you feel you're going to sleep. We have doctors and nurses on the premises. The worst you can do is cut your throat. Please do not interrupt us during the message, though. Wait till after the message to be treated medically. <laughs> I have a wonderful topic, developing personal holiness, and this is so needed today. In fact, I'm giving you permission to take this entire message with all the notes and take it back to your local church and teach it to your young people. The attack they are under is almost unimaginable. Between the internet and the movies and the TVs and the school environment, I don't know how anyone can survive. So take this material and use it in your local church. Now you have notes, if you'll follow the notes, uh, we can move uh, rapidly and move through this material because I only have two sessions today, today and tomorrow, excuse me. Let's begin with 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 and 16. It's right there on your notes and it's on the screen in back of me. As obedient children, oh I hate disobedient children, if I have time, I'll tell you a story about a group of disobedient children who came to our home, were hanging on our curtains, jumping from couch to couch, and the parents never said a word. I did not kill those children, though. I want you to know. I wanted to. <laughs> obedient children. That's the kind God wants. Then we have good fellowship with the Father. Obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In other words, your unsaved, unregenerate days. Don't live like those days. Don't ever conform to those again. You're done with that. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. Be holy. That means be separate. Be apart from. Well, we have a little bit of a definition right here in the text. It says, don't conform to your passions of your former life. Well, if you conform to the old ways, that's not being holy. It's unholy. Now, be holy in all your conduct, not just in Sunday morning, but in your thought life, your daily practice at work, in the family. Since it is written in the Old Testament in a number of places, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That's the standard, God-likeness, Christ-likeness, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Be careful, there's a lot of pseudo-holiness. It's really called sanctimony, people acting holy, but they're really unholy. It's God-likeness. Then Hebrews 12, verse 14, strive for peace with everyone. Strive for holiness. In other words, there's, there is some work to do here. We've heard that already. Without which, no one will see the Lord. Now, to understand the development of personal holiness, we have to go back to our New position in Christ. We're no longer in Adam. We are in Christ. The starting point for the Christian life is always the gospel and the transformation the gospel has worked in our lives. And so we're going to begin with this big question, who am I as a new creature in Christ? Roman numeral number one, Know who you are in Christ. I believe this is where we have to start as we unfold this topic of personal holiness in an unholy world. Know who you are in Christ. And the key word on this point is know, knowledge. Number one, Adam, the head of the human race. The Bible calls him the first man. God created Adam and Eve without sin. They had a glorious future as king and queen of the whole earth. They were to take dominion of the earth. They were to be fruitful. And they were to multiply. They were to have fellowship with God. They were to walk with God. They were not under the bondage of sin. Number two, Adam, the fallen head of the human race. 
But Adam and Eve fell into sin and condemnation. They disobeyed God. They believed the devil. They did not believe God. And as a result, they sinned. Condemnation came upon them. Death came upon them. And at that point, they fell into the bondage of sin. We read in Romans 5.12, Just as sin came into the world, sin came into the world, sin is looked at in this fifth chapter and sixth chapter as a great power, as a king, one who rules and dominates. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. So death spread to all men. That's why we have cemeteries all over the place. Because all sinned. Now, the Bible teaches that the entire human race is represented in this one man, Adam. When Adam fell, the whole race went down with him. And so we have that wonderful little phrase, in Adam. In Adam, all died, 1 Corinthians 15, 22. And then Romans 5, 19, by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. When Adam sinned, death came into the human race. It wasn't here before. Condemnation and curse and judgment came into the human race. But here's a key phrase that takes us to Romans chapter 6. We became the slaves of sin. We were in bondage, in chains to sin. Adam failed. And the consequences were catastrophic, catastrophic. There was no way Adam and his race could extricate themselves from this. They could not save themselves no matter how hard they would try. It was impossible. They were estranged from God now. In fact, they hid from God, ran from God. So God can send a second man a last Adam, to save the race. And that brings us to the last Adam, the obedient son. Adam sinned and brought death, but God sends a son. And his son is the Messiah of Israel, the anointed of God, the long-promised one, the seed of the woman. And he comes to earth, and he is absolutely perfect. He is sinless in thought and mind. In, In every part of his life, he is perfectly pleasing to the Father. He is obedient. And then, because of his complete obedience, he's able to actually offer up his life for Adam and his lost race and to give himself as a sin-bearing sacrifice and to take the condemnation and the curse, take it all upon himself and the death upon himself and to bring freedom and salvation and eternal life to the damage done by Adam. And so we have this wonderful little phrase, in Christ. It's actually used 164 times just in Paul's letters. And so we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Christ shall all be made alive. Notice in Adam they died, in Christ they're made alive. Romans 5, 19, by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now this brings us to the doctrine of our union with Christ, our incorporation into Christ, our our identification with Christ. Romans 6, 5 says this, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. This is a marvelous doctrine. It's God's doctrine. It's God's plan. No human would have ever thought up such a plan. When people say all religions say the same thing, that you must lose your mind to have to say such a thing. No religion is saying what Christianity is saying. No religion says there's a triune God. No religion says that, but Christianity. No religion talks about salvation like Christianity. All religions are basically self-salvation. This is a religion that says you can't even possibly save yourself. Someone else will have to do that for you. And you can actually enter into a union relationship, a faith human, hum, union relationship forever. So this is a foundation doctrine to our spiritual experience 
and our holiness before God. Now, union with Christ is seen in the Gospel of John. We see it, the vine and the branches. John 15, we see it in John 17, where the Lord says, I'm in you, you are in me, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, we are in you. This wonderful togetherness. We see it in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. Listen to this verse carefully. To them God chose to make known how great, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. What is the mystery? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ, the Messiah, in the Gentiles, living inside of them. This is brought out in Ephesians 5 with the marriage union. It's brought out in Ephesians 4 with the head-body relationship. We are in a relationship with Christ that is completely unique. It's like marriage. It's like the vine and the branch. It's like the head and the body. We are in him. He is in us. Now, we want to say just two things about union with Christ. Just two things we can say for our talks, and that is first, dead to sin, dead to sin. The crucifixion of the old man and the flesh. Romans 6.6, 6, our old self, or the old man, which it, what it literally says, was crucified with him, with Christ, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that, here's the purpose, we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Now, who is the old man, the old self? Well, let's find out who the new self is, and then we'll find out who the old one is. The new self is the person in Christ, our relationship with Christ. The person indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the person who is now alive to God. That's the new self, the new man. Now, the old man is the man related to Adam, under death, under condemnation, but under the bondage of sin. Now, in our relationship to Adam, we're done. It was crucified. When, when Christ died, we died with him there. Notice Galatians 6, 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. James Denny, in his tremendous work on the, the substitutionary work of Christ, the death of Christ, says this. Whoever sees into the secret of Calvary is conscious that the doom of sin is in it. It is death to the flesh with its passions and desires. So death brings an end to this old error and to this old relationship with Adam and with sin. We died to sin, Romans 6, 2, in Christ. Now, that brings us to no longer slaves to sin. One of the main points of Romans 6 is that the ruling power and the reign of sin, looked at as a great king, Ruling over the whole human race, sin and death, now it's been broken in Christ's death and our identification with him. So Romans 6, 2 says, how can we who died to sin still live in it? In our union with Christ, we died to sin. For sin will not have, for sin will have no dominion over you, Romans 6, 14. So, the power of sin, its reign over us, has been broken. You see, when you look at the news at night and you hear of all these scandals in our country, people go, why is this? Why is this happening? Because really, sin rules and reigns over the human race. We are under the bondage of sin. Great people with great minds and great futures do horrible, ugly, sinful things. Why? Because they're ruled by sin. And you want to know? They don't even know it. The average non-Christian man doesn't even know he's a slave to sin. Robert Chapman tells the story of a man who came to him, and he said this. He said he was a perfectionist, and he said that he had gotten back 
to the day of Adam's innocence before he sinned. And except for a few falls, he was perfect, like Adam. And Robert Chapman answered and said this, back to Adam's state? I would not change places with Adam before the fall for a hundred thousand worlds. I'm done with Adam. I'm in Christ, and I'm going to be made like Christ. And I'm going to be given a body like his someday. So there has been this breaking with sin. I remember the very first person I led to Christ was a friend. And before this fellow came to Christ, about every fifth word was a curse word. He could not speak without cursing. Cursing, cursing. Now, you know when you become a believer and you hear cursing, it grades on your ear. But for the unsaved, it just, it just rolls off their tongue. And he was a womanizer. I mean, basically, he lived to chase women. When he became born again, without even thinking of telling him, don't curse anymore and stop chasing women, unless you're a Christian, of course, <laughs> he stopped cursing. He just stopped cursing. Now, it doesn't mean that he didn't slip into a curse or he didn't think a curse. It doesn't mean that he didn't have thoughts about women that weren't right. It means that immediately there was some kind of break, a transformation in his life. Because he's done with Adam and all that that entails, and he has a new life, a new power over sin. And I thought it was so amazing. Number two, alive to God. So there's this negative side. When you come to Christ, when you are converted, you're done with the old, and now you're in Christ. The old's been crucified. There is power over sin. Sin's power has been broken. The full consummation of dealing with sin in this dead, this dead body will be at the resurrection. But there is presently power over sin and over death. Now, alive to God, that's the positive side. Notice we're a new creation, a new life in Christ, the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 16, 45. The last Adam, that's Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Two good verses. Look at these verses carefully. Romans 6, 4. We, too, might walk in newness of life. Look at Romans 7, 6. We serve in the new life, the new life of the Spirit. Two key words, two key words, get them. New and life. New and life. Something is brand new. Look at the word new, how, how often it appears in the New Testament. We're in a new age with a new head, a new race, a new man. And it's in the Spirit bringing us life. These are the two key words. In other words, there's a whole new way of life for the believer. He lives and walks and thinks in a different way. Now, let's look at this chart. I'll bring this chart up here. God, two men, Adam and in Christ. Thomas Goodwin said this, there are but two men standing before God, Adam and Christ. And these two men have all other men hanging at their girdle or their clothes. So when God looks down from heaven, he sees people either in Adam or in Christ. You cannot be in both. That's impossible, totally impossible. You're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You can't be a foot in each circle. Not possible. Now, at conversion, you move from being in Adam, which is crucified with Christ upon the cross, and there's a realm transfer. You're now under Christ, your new head. You were once in darkness, now you're in light. I'll tell you how radical this realm transfer is. We're told that once we were dead, now we're alive. That's how radical it is. Death and life. Can't get any more radical than that. Light and darkness. Adam or Christ. So, we need to start with our new position in Christ. We are new. And we have life. Divine life within us. And there has been a break with the old. Don't go back to the old. We have that warning all through the New Testament. Don't go back to the old. Don't live like the old. You're done with that. We live the new life. Now this brings us to Roman numeral number two, the application of this. 
be what you are in Christ. Now, I first said, know who you are in Christ. Now, it's experience that and live that, implement that, practice that, position and experience. Now, I notice on your chart in the computer, the arrow dropped off. You'll have to put the arrow in. The screen is correct on that. Be what you are in Christ. Now, if you look at this chart carefully, heaven is our home, <clears throat> and in heaven we'll be like Christ. In heaven, life experience and life reality will all come together perfectly. The consummation of our new position in Christ, the already not yet sanctification, all comes together. Be done with sin, done with death, done with this world, and we're part of a whole new heavens and a new earth. A new heavens and a new earth. Now notice <clears throat> what you are in Christ. Notice the top line. Now we call that the indicative. That's a mood uh, in a verb, and it means the mood of reality. For example, I say to you right now, it is raining out. That's a mood of reality. It's, it's a fact. So it's factual statements. Notice that much of the first part of Romans 6 is factual statements. This is true of you. You need to know who you are in Christ, the facts, what God has done for you in, in salvation. What is it to be in union with Christ, to have Christ as your head? What is it? Well, you'll spend the rest of your life learning that. It's all in the scriptures. But then there's the imperatives, the commands. The commands all come out of the indicative. They all come out of the statements of reality, who you are in Christ. Now, be. Be who you are in Christ. And these have to come together. It's been our life trying to bring these together, living out the reality of our new position in Christ. Now, if you know your New Testament, you know that often the epistles are organized on this chart. For example, he, uh, Ephesians has... The first three chapters, seated with Christ in the heavenlies, your position. Next three chapters, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ, your high calling. So the first three chapters are the indicative, are the reality, the factual statements of who you are, your new position in Christ, glorious. Second part of the book, let's live it, let's walk it. Let me try to illustrate this more. In other words, be who you are. Let's pretend there is a big giant sandbox out back. And you go out to this big, giant sandbox, and here is Dave Glock and Dave McLeod, and they're playing. they got tractors, and they're having more fun with those tractors and bulldozers, and they're building tunnels, and they got little bridges, and they are playing an entire week. Of course, they wait till the conference is over. A little stressed out from the conference, and so they're playing and playing in the sandbox. Well, after about a week of Dave and Dave playing in the sandbox, Linda McLeod comes out. She is mad. And she comes out and says, will you be men? Go to work. Be men. Now, can she say to the Dave and Dave, be men? Yes, of course. Lighten up a little bit. Yes, you can. <laughs> Come on, let's try this. Come on. <laughs> You're all falling asleep. I can see. Be men. Why can she say be men? Because they're men, right. Now, I have six grandsons. Can you imagine? They, they love to play in the sandbox. In fact, I took them to a lake just last week, and uh, unless I dragged them home, they were digging in the sand by the lakeside, making big tunnels and bringing water buckets in, and falling in the lake, and I brought them home. Sand and, and where? Just hand them to their parents. You better get them cleaned up. Look at these kids. So anyway, I was hated by my daughter. But anyway, that's all right. I can take it. Now, they're playing all day in the sand. Can I go out to them and say, be men? No, I can't, because they're not men. Now, the New Testament imperatives are, put on Christ. Put on Christ, because you've already put on Christ. So the imperatives, the Christian imperatives, the commands to us to live a certain way are always built on who we are as this new person in Christ. Let me give you another illustration. Let's just pretend that I was adopted by the Rockefeller family. They like me. They saw me at McDonald's. They said, you did a good job serving us. We want you in the family. And so they adopt me, and I take the Rockefeller name, I have official papers of adoption, and when I am adopted, I receive at my adoption time $250 million, which is what each of the Rockefeller sons did receive. 
Now, today, that would be like a billion dollars. So let's just say I receive at my adoption one billion dollars. And I am Alex Rockefeller. I'm not a Strauch anymore. I'm, I'm a Rockefeller. <laughs> now, you might want to pray about that because if I become one, I am going to, I promise you, give a large sum to Emmaus Bible College. <laughs> All right? Dave, you heard that. We'll talk about the, the exact details later. I am now officially a Rockefeller with $1 billion. So I go out and I get into my Volkswagen and I drive down to Burger King to eat and the Rockefellers come out and they go, you're a Rockefeller, you don't drive Volkswagens. Your limousine will be here to pick you up. And you do not eat at Burger King, you eat at Lafitte's. Nice French restaurant. <laughs> of course I have a billion dollars. You see, the Rockefellers will say to me, you're not a Strauch anymore, you're a, you're a Rockefeller. You live like a Rockefeller. You dress like a Rockefeller. You walk like a Rockefeller. You talk like a Rockefeller. And I'm sure I can get used to it really quickly. <laughs> well, the New Testament commandments are, you're a Rockefeller. You're in Christ. Don't go back. Don't go back to Adam. Don't go back to those old ways of this world. You've got new power, new life. Live that way. That's the New Testament imperative. Imperative. My dear, dear friends, let us never tire of teaching our position in Christ. Let's never tire of teaching these grand and glorious truths. When is the last time you were taught in your local assembly Romans chapter Five, six, seven, and eight. When have you talked about these wonderful truths in Adam, in Christ, and who you are now? Sinclair Ferguson writes this. One of our great needs as Christians is to catch a vision of this and to see our new life in Christ as the glorious and dignified thing that it really is. The great temptation most of us face is to believe that very little has happened to us through grace. Let's not minimize, let's maximize who we are in Christ. And now that we're in Christ, we are saints. We have been sanctified. We are holy ones. Even to the Corinthians, with all of their problems, Paul says this, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called saints. Stories told of Harry Ironside. He loved to witness. He was on a train, and he looked across, and here was a, a Catholic nun sitting there. And Harry was sitting there reading his Bible. So he thought, I, I'll go witness and so he went over and sat next to her and said, I, I just was reading my Bible, and I saw you sitting there, and I thought we could talk about the Lord. And she said to him, you know, I, I've got something against you Protestants. He said, what is it? He said, you Protestants don't have a priest. How can you have a relationship with God without a priest? Harry said, that's not true. We have a priest. We have a great high priest, and he's in heaven, and he prays for us every day. Plus, I am a priest. Every believer is a priest. Oh, she wasn't happy with that at all. I am a priest to God. He's made us all priests, a kingdom of priests. And he said, not only am I a priest, I'm a saint. And she said, now you've gone too far. <laughs> yes, we are priests. We have priestly ministry, prayer, teaching the word. And we are holy ones, saints in Christ, not in Adam. In Christ, we have been sanctified, set apart, dedicated to God. Let's maximize these truths. Let's teach them a lot, not once every 20 years, but regularly. God wants you to know that great things have happened to you, glorious things. You can hardly conceive of it. And someday you will be resurrected from the dead and given an imperishable body forever and be made like Christ. We're done with Adam. 
Do you teach Romans in your church? It's a wonderful book. In my own personal discipling of people, I always start them in Romans. I was just with a young man who graduated from a Christian college, and I said, now what are you gonna do? You just graduated. He says, I don't know. I said, that's the danger. You don't know. You'll flounder for the next four or five years. You'll go backward. I said, you need to work even harder now. I said, I want you to start studying Romans and prepare talks on Romans and find a group of people and have a Bible study with Romans. Force yourself to produce and to study harder and be diligent. So many people get out of college and they just stop reading, stop studying, and basically coast. I always recommend the book, keep lots of copies on hand, Justification and Atonement by Martin Lloyd-Jones, Romans 3, 20, uh, uh, 21 to 421. Romans 3, 21 to 421, Justification and Atonement. Start with the gospel. What is the gospel? Love the gospel. Know the gospel and the transformation that the gospel has brought into your life. Everything I've said to you, this chart, I want you to take it home and teach it to somebody. Get yourself a good commentary like Doug Moo or Tom Schreiner and, and read these chapters, Romans 6, 7, 8. Actually, you have to start with 5. 5 is the foundation. God's government. Two men, Adam, Christ. Now, dealing with sin in the flesh, number three. Now, we, we, we had to lay the foundation. We had to do that. We had to tell us who we are in Christ. Don't just jump into holiness. Don't just jump into don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Know who you are first. That's the starting point according to the New Testament. You always start with in Christ. What the gospel has done. The transformation. Let's deal now with very practical matters, dealing with sin in the flesh. Although sin, its rule, its reign, its complete power over us has been crucified, which means put to death, there still is the threat of sin. We're still in this life. We're still in the body of sin, as Paul calls it, which refers to the whole person still infected by sin. It won't be until death that we'll be finally done with it, finally done with it. But a significant change has taken place. Sin is still with us. And you can see that all through the New Testament. You see the sinful behavior of the Corinthians and the, the exhortations to turn from that and to turn from the old life. Don't go back to the old life. Don't walk like the Gentiles. That's written to Christians. Well, how do we have victory over sin? The power has been broken, but we still struggle with sin right to the end. In fact, Peter says it's actually wages war against our soul. So that's what we're going to look at the rest of our time and tomorrow evening. How do we deal with sin? In fact, Martin Luther said something very interesting with Dr. Ryrie said something similar. Really, the Christian struggles with sin in a way the non-believer does, doesn't because he understands sin. The unbeliever sins and doesn't even think it's sin. One of our missionaries returned from the field and he said, in the country I worked, they have in their minds, in their psyche, no concept of sin. They don't believe they're sinners. And when you tell them they're sinners, they feel you're, you're, you're doing bad things to people. We're not sinners. We're good people. They don't even have a concept. So the Christian, in a sense, struggles with sin, unlike the unbeliever, because the Christian now is new and alive. Holy Spirit lives inside. We're a new creation. We have a new consciousness, a new renewed mind. And we are very sensitive to sin, aren't we? And so in that sense, it troubles us more than the unbeliever because of the renewed mind, the new life of God within us. So how do we deal with this? All right, number one, believe what God says about you in his word. Look at Romans 6, 11. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Notice, consider, reckon, think it through. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Romans 6, 18, having been set free from sin, we read you are united with Christ. Now, how many of you feel united with Christ? Get up in the morning and go, whew, I'm united with Christ, like glue. How many feel that they're delivered from the bondage of sin? You died with Christ. Well, some of you get up in the morning, you can hardly get out of bed. Some of you do struggle with sin to the sense that you say, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. How did you get into Christ? How did you become a part of Christ instead of Adam? 
Well, you believe the promise. You believe the word of the Lord, the, the gospel. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You believed and you were saved. A great transformation took place. And now you know what God says about you. You're a saint. You're a holy one. Uh, you're in Christ. You're alive to God. Sin will not have to have power over you. How do you live the Christian life? Same way you got saved. You have to believe what God says. You say, but I don't feel in union with Christ. Doesn't matter how you feel. God doesn't say, do you feel this? How, how, how deeply do you feel this? No, you have to believe it. God said it, you believe it. That's why in Romans, you have the story of Abraham in the fourth chapter. He shows you the life of, of the believers like Abraham. He believes the promise. Abraham had no children. Wife was past childbearing years. And yet he believed that he would be the father of a multitude of nations. Why? Why did he believe that? Because God said it. God promised it. And God's trustworthy. And because he believed that God counted that as righteousness to him. So a lot of these things you don't feel. But God says it. It's true of you. You are a saint. All right. I have to live like a saint because God says it. You live the Christian life by, by faith, by believing him. Lots of things we don't feel like. I'm safe, secure because of Christ. I was at a place in Lafayette, Louisiana, and there was a, a Bible study in a home, so I went to visit it that evening. I was not the teacher, but it was John Faulkner teaching it, and he had several brand new believers there, about 10 people around the table having a Bible study. He wanted me to see this study and meet some of these new believers, and so they're talking about once you are saved and in Christ, you are saved forever. And so John Faulkner turns to me and he says, right, Alex, you cannot lose your salvation. Oh, I said, yes, you can lose your salvation. <gasps> he said, explain yourself. I said this, you can lose your salvation when Christ falls out of heaven. You're only as secure as Christ is secure because you're in Christ. That's why I'm safe. By the way, I don't think he's going to fall out of heaven. But I'm just <laughs> telling you. You're as safe as Christ is safe. You believe that because God has said it and he is trustworthy. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Doesn't feel that way sometimes. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. 1 John 5, 4. We believe what God says about us and we act upon it. Just like Abraham did with the promises of God. Then number two. So it starts with faith in the promises and the factual statements that God makes in Romans 5, 6, 7, 8, in Ephesians 4, Colossians chapter 3, all these glorious, glorious statements about our new position. You believe them. It's not a matter of feeling them. Number two, daily put to death sin in the flesh. This is repeated in the New Testament. To be holy will mean to abstain from evil. And the passions of the flesh is to abstain from anything that would defile us and cause us to sin, to be holy. So let's look at some of these passages and then apply them. Let not sin, therefore, now you can only say this to a person who's in Christ. Let not sin, therefore, reign like a king on a throne dominating your life. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies General term for usually what sin uses to express itself, but includes the whole person, to make you obey their passions. Notice, let not sin reign. You can only say that to a person who's had the power of sin broken and is in Christ. You can't say that to a non-Christian. Romans 13, 14, a very important verse and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't put on the Lord Jesus Christ unless you have put him on. In other words, you put him on because you already have him. In other words, implement it. Put it into reality, into experience, into daily practice. Put on the character, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's a great secret to dealing with sin in the flesh. Make no provision, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The flesh here connotes the human condition of mankind in his weakness and in its corruption. It is the seat of sinful passions. 
It is the realm in which the non-Christian lives. It is that which opposes everything the Holy Spirit stands for. It is totally oriented to this world and life. It cannot be reformed. Don't think, I'll reform the flesh. Or, I'll reform, I'll get back to Adam's state of innocence. No, it's not possible. It has to be just put to death. And it was put to death with Christ on the cross. Number three, beloved, I urge you, as sojourners and exiles, in other words, you don't belong to this world. You say, I don't feel like that. Well, that's what God says, so just believe it. Abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. And then, if by the Spirit you put to death, notice, and this has been emphasized in this conference, so I'll emphasize it. You put to death by the Spirit. The deeds of the body you will live. All right, so this is a basic New Testament teaching. What do you do in your daily experience, in your battle with sin, which wages war against you, in a world of defilement, in a world that is against you, a world that's trying to, like a gigantic super-duper magnet, pull you down? Well, he says, put it to death. How do you do that? Well, first of all, it's done, Romans 8, 13, by the Spirit. In other words, you have now the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. You have power inside you. You have life inside you. You don't do this alone. You can pray, Lord, use by your Spirit. Help me to deal with this sin. And you call upon God to empower you because you've got the power. It's inside you already. You can act based on his enablement. So you're not alone in this battle. It's not just grin and bear it, pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Number two, you must choose and decisively act against sin. This is human responsibility. Now it is confusing. People say, well, what does the Holy Spirit do and what do I do? Well, this is a big word. The word is concursive. It means more than one agent is involved. It's not just you involved, and it's not just the Holy Spirit involved. And so it has been rightly said from the beginning of this conference that the Holy Spirit is acting and working and prompting and enabling you in your daily Christian life, in your battle with sin. At the same time, you must choose and you must act. How do they work together? The Bible never says. It does not explain those kinds of details. It never gets into it. It's like, how do you walk in the Spirit? Well, you walk. How do you learn to walk? You walk. You put one foot in front of the other foot. We've heard this already. So, the Spirit is at work in you. He enables. He enlightens. He guides. At the same time, don't just say, well, I've got to wait till the Holy Spirit does it. I can't do it. No. You act upon the promises of God and the commands of God. You act upon both. Notice, you put to death. You put to death. You pray. Seek guidance from other people. Ask the Lord to enable you and help you. But you move forward. Then, the principle of amputation. Principle of amputation. Jesus gave this. He says, if your eye offends you, well, just rip it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. What he means is treat sin radically. That's what he means. Treat sin radically. Don't mess around with sin. Don't fool around with sin. Can I give you a principle? Whenever you play with sin, you lose. That's how simple that principle is. How would you like to be on a sports team that you're guaranteed every single time you will lose? Guaranteed. No, there's no way you, can, you can't possibly win. You're guaranteed it. How would you like to be on a team like that? Every time you fool with sin, you will lose. You fool with pornography, you lose. You fool around with too much alcohol, you lose. You fool around with uh, sins of lust or gambling or, or you get used to the little white lies, you lose. Can't win. No way you can win. God built that into the principle. So there's only one way to deal with sin. Amputate it. Deal with it radically and decisively. Don't play with sin because you lose. It's like a rattlesnake. Guess what? People who play with rattlesnakes, guess what happens? They get bit. I just read in the paper uh, about 
the leading rattlesnake handler in the United States, a religious man, they use it in their religious worship. He just died of, of, of a rattlesnake bite. Now, guess why he died of a rattlesnake bite? Because he was playing with rattlesnakes. Do you know I've never been bitten by a rattlesnake? Because I don't go near them. I've seen them up live, close, I run right into them in the road. I just walk way around. Do you know people have been bitten by rattlesnakes that are dead? Did you know that? Because even after they're dead, they're hit by a car. People will run down the road, and they'll pick them up, want to cut them up or take the uh, rattles off, and they're still uh, nerves that are reacting, and they pick up the rattlesnake, and that rattlesnake dead will bite them. So here's the point. It's a real simple point. Don't play with rattlesnakes. <laughs> Don't put them in your pocket. Don't go, ooh, these are cute rattlesnakes. Look at them. Don't do that. You ever see these guys on TV doing that? You see them? Don't do that. I was watching Animal Planet, and this fellow is a cobra expert. And he's getting up next to this cobra, and he's just shooting pictures right in this cobra's face. Guess what happened? And I'm glad they let the camera keep rolling. That cobra bit him right on the hand. And I said to my wife, good for him. <laughs> Don't look in the face of a cobra. And you want to see a change in, in tone in that, that documentary when he just dropped that camera, they ran around him, uh, thing, cut his finger, pulled it, put him in the, in the car, and took him right to the hospital. Now, if you play with sin, you're going to get bit. Just remember that. Put it to death, stay far away from it, treat it like a rattlesnake. It also says, make no provision. This is terrific. Don't make provision. Now, you know what this means. You, you're going camping, and so... You prepare all your goods. You want to have everything you need with you. You want to feel comfortable. You pack that car with 10 times the stuff you need. You make all the provisions you can so you can go camping. Don't do that with the flesh. Don't make any provisions for it. You have a problem with drinking too much. Don't make provision. Don't bring alcohol in the home. Just don't even have it in the home. You say, well, I've got friends coming or my relatives are not Christians and they have to have some alcohol. Just tell them, I have a problem with this. They'll understand it perfectly. That's making a provision. You don't even go into a restaurant that has that smell because you know that smell and that smell will draw you to drink. You don't, you don't pamper it. You don't make provisions for it. You don't make allowances for it. You are radical. If you have a problem with gambling, you know more people than you realize have a problem with gambling. They gamble online now. They have different ways to gamble. And you know what they'd say? They'll say something like this. Well, we're driving out to California and it's so cheap to stay in Las Vegas. Hotels are cheap. The foods are cheap. And I'm just going to start with a couple quarters. This is a true story. These two fellows who hadn't worked for years and done anything right, and they, they borrowed all this money. They're going to start a new business. So they borrow this money. Someone signs on the dotted line for them to start this new business, and they're all excited. And the one fellow says to the other fellow, I really believe if we go down to Las Vegas, I can double this money. So they go down to Las Vegas with this newly borrowed money to start their business and hitchhike home. They lost it all. So don't go to Las Vegas if you have a problem with gambling. Don't make provisions. If you have a problem with pornography, if you have a problem seeing these pictures, don't make provision for that. You make sure that you are always near safety when you're on the, on the Internet. You make sure there's all kinds of protections for you. These are things that bother all of us. You're not that you're some different kind of person but you don't make provisions for it. He says you actually abstain. You abstain from these things. That's the way you deal with sin. You put it to death. You're radical with it. You amputate it. You don't make provision for it. You abstain from it. You want to know where it is? Go far away. Put it to death. Just remember this one principle. Every time you play with sin, you will lose. And you can't even compromise with it. You can't just have a little bit. It's like the drinker who just says, just a little bit. Be in the world, but not of the world. Separation from the world. Separation from the world. All right. Be in the world, but not of the world. Separation. There is separation. There is separation. Proper biblical separation. Let's look at a few scriptures. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement 
of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion. Now, the context here is don't be unequally yoked. In other words, don't fool around with uh, Corinthian religion, idolatry, the banquets, the, the temple of feasts. Uh, do, not fool, you, you do, do not yoke yourself with those things. You will be defiled. You'll get dragged in. You'll go back to the old life. Holiness and defilement do not mix. James 1, 20, 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to keep oneself unstained from the world. 1 Peter 1, 14, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. In other words, your unsaved days. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. All right, let's do this quickly. The great illustration of this is the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel. Constant problem, worldliness. Wanting to be like the other nations. When God called them to be radically different than the other nations, the way they would witness to the other nations was to be under the law of God and be so different from the polytheistic nations. Listen to Leviticus 18. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt where you lived. And you shall not do as they do in the land of Cana. You shall not walk in their ways. Psalm 106.35 says this, They, Israel, mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. That was God's call to Israel. Holiness. Apart from the world. Separate from the world. So radically different. That the world would notice and they would see the people of the true and one and only living God. That was Israel's call to holiness, to separateness. But they utterly failed. They said, we want a king and we want him to be like the other nations. They loved those Baals. They loved those other religions and the ways of the world and it destroyed them. Listen to 1 Peter 2, 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. There is a war. There is a war against you to destroy you. And, and, and my real heart beat today is for our young people. The influence of secular society is just hardly, unbe hardly believable. It wages war against us 24 hours a day, 24 hours a day. I think of the TV. My dear friends, you've got to come to grips with the TV. If you watch filth, you become filthy. You can't be holy watching lots of unholy things. You know, if you watch regular TV, it is so just acceptable. People are living together and people are lying and, and people are fornicating and, and, they, and they're, it's almost super saturated with homosexuality today. After a while, you just think, well, that's, that's normal. That's normal. Christian parent in our church, utterly shocked when the girl comes home one day and says to her mother, why are you so uptight about homosexuality? You've got to be careful with TV. It will defile you. And Peter says here, we're, we're only strangers and sojourners. We don't actually belong here. You've got to abstain. You've got to abstain. For anything that would defile you will wage war against your soul. All the values that we believe are mocked on TV. There's hardly really anything good on TV except maybe Animal Planet. <laughs> and even there you get bit by cobras. Do you not realize that the people who are putting on these TV shows are great teachers? They have something to teach you. And they want you to know that people who reject homosexuality and living with whoever you want out of marriage, they are narrow bigots. They're dinosaurs. They're people from the dark ages. They are teaching all day long and you're just opening your mouth and swallowing it whole movies this is actually true young people know more about the stars of hollywood than they know of abraham isaac and jacob 
that is an actual fact. Ask young people. Who's the wife of Abraham? They don't have a clue. One girl I asked you in the restaurant, we often play this game, then I can leave some tracks or something. If their name is Sarah or Rachel. I just say, hey, in the Bible, you're a name in the, name in the Bible. Great ancient name, yeah. I said, who is the wife of Abraham? And he goes, oh. I just forgot what she said. Something like Ahithophel or something like that. Just totally off the charts. Going, don't you know the wife of Abraham was Sarah? No, no, I didn't know that. People know nothing about the Bible. Hollywood has taken over their minds. Really, most movies, the vast majority of movies, just perpetuate sexual immorality. Perpetuate it. They're teaching it. They're, they're selling a, a, a package. They're selling goods. And little by little, like the frog in the kettle, we buy it. And then friends. Oh, this is a big one. Friends. Unsafe friends. I was just in Mexico for a whole week, and I talked to parents. I had one night where I had 150 young people, just high schoolers, and boy, I had a wonderful evening with them. But I had talked to parents before, so they had let me know what was going on. These young people, it's a battle for their souls. You see, in Mexico, it's a party culture. They love the party. They love fellowship. They, they love relationship. And uh, the young people go out in high school. They go out to Acapulco together as a group of high schoolers. Or they go to someone's house and they party all the evening. And the Christian young people feel totally out of it. And the Christian young people say, I, I want to go to the party. In every case where parents compromised and said, okay, you can go to some of the parties, they've ultimately lost all their children. And so I've said to, have to say to parents, you cannot compromise on this. You will lose your child. Just hand them over to the devil. Just call, open the door, let the devil in, say, come on, take my children. You can't compromise on this. You can't let them go into party land. Because if they go into party land, with all the dancing, all the music, all the lights, all the drinking, you cannot, you cannot resist that. Watch MTV for a minute. Just see these videos of what they present. All the people dancing, the lights flashing. They're half, all half naked anyway. And it's so appealing. It's so attractive to a young person. You can't fight that. So you don't let them in. You just say, no, I, I cannot let you do this. We'll do things. We'll take you away with some of the young people. We'll do sing together. And unsafe friends, unsafe friends. Oh, what's wrong with your parents? Your parents are like out of, out of it, totally out of it. Maybe they're mentally ill or something. Get them some medication. What's wrong with your parents? The first great battle I had in my Christian life after becoming a Christian was my friends, unsafe friends who were dragging me back into the world. And I don't know what age I was, about 13 and I, or 14, and I realized I've got to break with them. I can't stand against them. I'm not strong enough. They're doing all these things. They talk a certain way. They curse a certain way. All they do is talk about women, and all they do is this, this, and that. And I realized I can't stand against that. They drag me down every time. And the first great battle I had as a Christian was I had to turn away from those people. I could not, I could not compromise with my friendships, and I had to get new friends, and the old friends had to go. That was my first battle as a Christian. Remember, it's a very decisive act. And we need to tell our young people this. And it's part of the parenting job to keep our children from bad company. It's a major part of parenting. You let your kids go with bad kids and just wave goodbye to them. The internet today. You know, there's a sense in which sin is coming into the world in a new way. Through the internet. Things can come into your house that people never saw in human history. Human history. You can see the most beautiful people in the world have sexual intercourse right in front of you. That, that never happened in the human race. And now just press a button and you can have that. Well, who can resist that? You're 14, 15, 16. It's a problem with girls and boys. The average age to addiction to pornography is 11 years of age. There are more porno shops than there are McDonald's. I mean, these kids don't have a chance. I mean, my heart literally bleeds for young people today. These things did not exist when I was a teenager, and I thank God they didn't. How do you resist them? They're so powerful. And then you think of the magazines, you think of advertisements, you think of school and university and, and high schools. Uh, it just, just, just like a vacuum sucks our young people away from us. Basically, we're to abstain from this kind of behavior and this kind of life. We are to be separate from it. We're to be separate in a way that protects us 
from Satan and this entire world which is trying to destroy us. Trying to own our children. It is a war. There are evil forces. There is darkness. There are demonic forces. And they control the airwaves. They control the media today. And if you are naive, you will be sucked in. You don't even have a chance. You won't even know what's happening to you. You'll just become like the world. And so we have many Christians today who are no different than the world. In fact, when they hear the things of God, they get rather angry. Peter says, abstain from the passions of the flesh, and this is absolutely true, which wage war against your soul. Tomorrow night, we'll look at the positive side. This has been the negative side. We'll look at the positive side. And John, thank you, you gracious man, age of dispensation of grace. Let us pray. Lord, help us in this battle with sin, in this battle with this world, that we may not love the world, but we may see it for what it really is, Christ rejecting, hateful of Christ, trying to ruin and destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Help us in this battle. Awaken us. Strengthen us. Alert us. Help us to take action. Work in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. That we would be a separate people. A holy people. That we would be different. Really different. That we would live like Christ. We would be Christ-like. We would show the fruits of the Spirit. We would show the life of God within us. To all these ends, we acknowledge we cannot do these things on our own. We thank you that we're alive with the Spirit. And he works in us. It is a reality. By faith we believe and we act upon it. In Christ's name, amen.